We're gonna make it look fly with some DIY. We're gonna make it look fly with some DIY. We're gonna make it look fly with some DIY. Uh oh, thrift diving. Hey, what's up? It's Serena Pia from thriftdiving.com, which is a blog, a YouTube channel, and a new podcast where we're talking about decorating and improving your home with paint, power tools, and of course, you know how we do. We love thrift stores, and we're not sacrificing our budget, our environment, or our style. All right, so today in episode seven, we are talking with someone who knows a thing or two about thrift stores. If you could see the pictures of her home on Instagram, you would love how she pulls together and she buys a lot of antiques. A lot of times people will say, well, Serena, I don't know how to pull together all of these things, all of these looks and styles that I'm buying from the thrift store. So today we're going to dig in deep to talk about how you do that. How do you find and mix and match things from the thrift store affordably so that it all looks like it blends cohesively together? So today we're going to be talking to Jamela Wallace. She's someone who actually has been following my blog for quite a while and we're Facebook friends. And I can tell you that if she lived next door, you would never see us separated. (laughs) I'm pretty sure we'd be having a good time every Friday and Saturday night. And we'd be thrifting together or thrift diving together. So let's jump into this episode with Jamela Wallace and let's talk about some thrift tips to help you decorate your home on a budget. Today, I am talking to Jamela, aka Kim Wallace. (laughs) And I am really excited to talk to you because I know we have been Facebook friends for quite a while. I'm not even sure how we met. I know it was probably through blogging. And I've been seeing the stuff that you post on Instagram, on Facebook, and it blows me away. And you just have such a wonderful eye for design and being able to put things together that you find from the thrift store. And I thought, I want to talk to you. And we had planned this for a while. And then we just kind of forgot, or let's just put it this way. I forgot. (laughs) And in doing some of these edits Mm -hmm. this week for the podcast, I remembered, hey, we were supposed to meet. So that's why we're talking today. And I'm so excited to talk to you. So welcome to the Thrift Diving Podcast. (laughs) Thank you again, Serena. I appreciate you reaching out to me so much. And I was excited about this because I have been a fan of yours for ever since Thrift Diving began. Okay. Wait a minute. Now you you do know thrift diving started way back in 2012. <laughs> yes, I do know. And that's what? how long I've been following you. Oh my gosh. Are you serious? Yeah. What? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Oh, I found sh- you through Home Talk. Wow. Yeah. It's been a long time because it's I have not posted on Home Talk in quite a while. Loved everything that you were doing. I was like, wow, I really like her. And so I said, I'm going to follow her. And I've been following you ever since. Yes. We so are kindred like spirits. Her. So finally, you know, come face to face with you. Yes. I know one day maybe we'll get to meet if I ever get yeah. myself down there to South Carolina. <laughs> you are in South Carolina. Where exactly in South Carolina do you live? I am in a small town called Whitmire. And we are right in the middle of the big cities of Columbia, Spartanburg, and Greenville. We're a little town that's nestled in the Sumter National Forest. The population is about maybe 1,500 people. Small wow. town. Very yes, I, and I come from Newark, New Jersey, which is like the mecca of city life. And I came here because my husband, his family is from here. We came here, we wanted to leave the big city and we chose here. So, and I don't regret it. I don't blame you. Everything up this way, I'm in Maryland and Maryland is still technically considered the South, but I, I consider myself the North compared to where you live. Right. And everything this way and up, It's Mm -hmm. so expensive. And I know you and I have a, we're going to continue this conversation in another podcast because we're going to talk about real estate investing. Yes. I know I've never talked about that on thrift diving, but I think as I was telling you earlier, it's a natural flow for people like us. Like we love ugly things and we love Mm -hmm. making ugly things pretty. So that will be coming up in the next episode. So stay tuned, Mm -hmm. listen to that. But how did you get started with thrift stores like how what is your story of because everybody has that story that memorable story of how they came to love thrift stores Mm -hmm. well I began loving furniture when I was young in my uh, like around 15 years old and my grandmother had this vanity that we used to love like pretending dress up in front of 
she called us one day and said, hey, they're throwing furniture out. There's a nice vanity down the street from me. So we got in the car. My mother took us over there. He was like, mommy, uh, Mar called and said they're throwing away the van. Can we go get it? So she took us over there. We got it. We brought it home. Me and my sister, I have a twin sister, and we both love thrifting. From that point on, we brought the vanity home and we painted it and we loved it. And we used it. My father said, what are you doing bringing that junk in the house? We were like, what? Typical you know? man. <laughs> yes. And he really busted out. But then when we painted it and made it look so pretty, he was so impressed. He couldn't believe it. So from that point is when we began loving antique furniture, thrifting, because we never, I mean, when, you know, p- furniture on the side of the road was always considered a bad thing. You don't get that. People are throwing it wet, but it mm-hmm. was in good shape. It just needed, you know, a little TLC. A little bit of TLC. Yeah. So from that point on, we've always loved it. And then as I got, you know, older and got married, I started venturing into uh, antique stores to get furniture and things like that, because the idea of having what everybody else has, you know, you go into the showroom, you pick out the furniture and that's the whole set and everybody else has that set. (laughs) Yes. I hated it. I mean, I did it when I was first, first married and then I just couldn't live with it. I just said, you know what? This is not me. I like different pieces. So Mm -hmm. from that point on, that's when we started going into thrift stores. And back then it was called secondhand stores. So that's where I started buying all my furniture from secondhand stores. You know, when I was growing up, we, well, I'm from Hagerstown, which is a little, I say a little, it's not little like where you're from. This is maybe, let's say 70,000, but it's small compared to where I live now in Silver Spring. But growing up in Western Maryland, if you shopped at thrift stores, Mm -hmm. you were made fun of, you were poor, you know, we, we had a thrift store there called the mission. And as a kid, we would go around and now my mom was going to the thrift store because we were poor, but we also made fun of other kids going to the mission. So we always tease them fishing at the mission. So, and I fishing at the mission, you went fishing Mm -hmm. at the mission, look at your clothes. But as I have become an adult and a mother Uh, a homeowner. It's this cool thing that people do now. And we, you know, you and I, we were doing it before it was really a cool thing. Right. And I think these stores, these thrift stores and these antique shops, they're understanding that it's a cool thing now. And the prices reflect that because some stores, Mm -hmm. and I hear from readers all the time that things are so expensive, what you and I could get for $40, Mm -hmm. it's three times that. So how do you go about finding a good deal Have the thrift stores in your area realized that it's a cool thing or can you still get a good deal in South Carolina? I could get still a good deal down this area. The prices are not crazy. What I'm finding more crazy is the prices that are on the Facebook marketplace. Mm. It seems like people are trying to sell their items a little bit, you know, like what you would find in an upscale type antique store. I don't haggle with anybody over prices. I don't Mm -hmm. do that. Okay, because I was in the business and no, I am still in the business of selling antiques and um, furniture and things like that. But if someone wants a fair price for their item, I'll just pay it. If I don't want to pay it, then I'm just going to move on. I'm not going to haggle you for five, 10, 15 bucks. I'm not going to do that. But in this area, I could still find some good pieces for 30, 40 dollars. Mm. Um, Case in point, my favorite one that I sent you, but we'll talk about that too. Yes. But you could always find a lot of good quality pieces that some needs a little work, some don't need a little uh, any work at all, but the prices are still fair to me. And then I have a, a firm belief that the older items, if they're still good and they're still standing, they're still in good shape they're worth it because the newer stuff, I'm just finding the quality is just not there. I've gone to several yard sales where people are selling like Broyhill. Even the new Broyhill is not the same as the old Mm Broyhill. They carry the name, but the quality of the furniture is not the same. Oh yeah. So a lot of these companies, I think they cut corners. I mean, you see it from furniture, even the food that you buy. Remember you could get a loaf of bread that was this big, of course, right. people who are listening can't see this big, but just imagine mm-hmm. how much a loaf of bread used to be in terms of width right. and everything's shrunk it's down. Right. And so they're keeping either keeping the cost the same and lowering the quality or they're increasing the cost the and yeah. the hey. quality the same. 
way too much more. I mean, I, I was at a thrift store, a restore habitat out near the Charlotte area. And they even had like High Point, the furniture maker in North Carolina, then High Point, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. They had some chairs and stuff out there. And those chairs were like 30 bucks. Whereas I know if you went to High Point Market and bought them, you're going to pay way more. Mm -hmm. But even then the quality wasn't there. So right. I, I just said, I still like the old stuff. Anything from before the 70s mm -hmm. to me. The Good 80s quality. furniture, right. The 80s furniture was borderline, the lacquer stuff. So that was starting to leave. But the 90s furniture, I just don't see it. I mm -hmm. don't see it. You know, I did a podcast interview episode. I believe it was episode three with a woman named Kaveri Marate. Mm -hmm. And even though she and I were discussing thrift store clothing and the wastefulness and the impact on the environment that it yes. has yes. for clothing, we can say the same is true for furniture. furniture. You know, yes. just imagine the process that it has to go through. And the way she described it, at least with clothing, is maybe the cotton is grown in Texas and then shipped off to another country and sewn and then it's shipped back. And when you think about furniture today that you buy brand new, that's yeah. not good quality. I'm just going to put it out there. Ikea, I like to take Ikea, for example, because yes. that's something you would buy for maybe your first place when you don't have a lot of money. The quality of that, it's generally not going to last. Now I have yeah. to tell you my bed, this is a funny story. When we first moved into our condo, 2002, we didn't have a lot of money. So we bought some Ikea stuff. Of course, we thought Ikea was like wonderful. Right. Not that it's not, it's, it, it serves its purpose with That's some right. things, but we bought a brand new bed and a dresser and some nightstands. And no lie, we kept it for 18 years. I literally just replaced it. So when I say that Ikea can't last, mm -hmm. it can, but if you actually removed my mattress and saw how we piecemealed this thing together for 18 years, <laughs> <laughs> my husband weighs like 200 and some odd pounds. He's a big guy. If he would even shift the pieces mm -hmm. of plywood we put underneath, the whole bed mm -hmm. would just goof and just <laughs> fall out. <laughs> but if I had just bought a quality bed from day one, it, I wouldn't have had this problem. So I think it's an important point that you're talking about good quality, because not only is it better for the environment, but you're going to keep this quality piece for maybe even the rest of your life. So right. you're not going to be contributing to that environmental factor of buying new. And then in five years, it's falling so apart. I get rid of it. Yes. I, I don't understand that. I mean, my bed um, that I sleep in is from the twenties, the 1920s. Wow. So, yeah. My whole bedroom suit, all my furniture is, is antique. This is when I was antiquing mm -hmm. and I was buying the, the good furniture, the old furniture. So my bedroom is from the 1920s. My kids beds, they're vintage beds as well. And they're still in great shape. I just redid them over, painted them, and then put some fabric over them to give them a more modern look just yeah. recently. All of them are from antique stores. And then if you look at the style, they're kind of like replicating them all over again. Why not buy old? Why not buy authentic instead of buying the replica? Because the replicas, look, you just could tell the difference. Exactly. Now, you bring up a good point about your bedroom furniture being from the 20s. And this is one thing that I love about your style is because you have good quality pieces but it all works together. And I'm sure everything that you buy is not from the same era. Like you've got some modern pieces, you've got some 1920s pieces. The big question that I have, and I know other people who have shared with me their biggest challenge that come to thrift diving and say, I need help. The big challenge is how do you put it all together to make it look cohesive? Because if People go to your Instagram and what's your Instagram? It's your vintage girl with the you are vintage girl. You are vintage girl. Okay. We're going to have yes. links in the show notes to everything. Yes. But when people look at all of your pictures, it just looks so well put together. Maybe it's just something that you know how to do and you can't ex ex explain. like describe or explain how you put it together. But what are some tips that you could give to people who do find different pieces mm -hmm. from different eras? How do you put that all together? For the most part, I look for pretty much the same wood blend, so to speak, because like I said, my bed is Victorian. My lingerie chest is French. And then my dresser set is Art Deco. 
So I kind of pieced them all together. But the one common thing is the wood all blends together. Mm, that's and important. That kind of keeps it, kind, yes, that kind of keeps it cohesive without looking at all these different wood tones. So, so that's it seems one of like, the- can I just say, so it seems like you, you have to, you have to be mindful of that when you go to the store then, because I know for myself, when I go and I see something that I like, I may mm-hmm. buy it and not know exactly where it's going to go. So when you go right. to the thrift store and you know that this is the wood tone that you have for your bedroom, mm-hmm. are you going there with the intention of, okay, I, I know what my wood tone is, so I'm only going to buy in that wood tone? Or will you sometimes just buy something because you like it and then later try to find things that match it? I would do that exactly what you just said. If I saw something that I really, really like and I don't know where I'm going to put it, I'm going to bring it home anyway. That's number one. <laughs> you know, I am not going to let a good deal pass because <laughs> you know, and I know, it's hard to find stuff sometimes. And when yes, you come it across is. it, just get it, okay? And worry about the aftermath later. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> because sometimes things can be, now sometimes when you find things that maybe the wood doesn't match, do you refinish mm-hmm. it so that you can match that wood match tone? It. Yeah, you could stain, yes. I have restained some things. As a matter of fact, when I first found my bed, it didn't have the wood tone that I needed it to match the art deco because I had my dressers first and the bed that went with the dresser, I didn't care for the shape of it. Mm -hmm. So when I found this Victorian bed, the antique lady who I purchased it from, she did refinishing. I didn't know anything about refinishing back then. And she said, oh, well, I could stain it to match it. So I took the drawer off the little nightstand. And I said, just make it match that. Mm-hmm. And that's what she did. And she blended it with different colors and kind of faded it in. And she did a wonderful, wonderful job. And this mm-hmm. woman back then, she was around maybe 70, 69, wow. 70 years old. And to this day, I, I owe credit to her for teaching me a lot about antiques, refinishing. She showed me some little things, but she educated me on getting into the business mm-hmm. of how to find good pieces. So, and her name was Joyce and I really, really credit her for a lot of the education that she gave me. And we became very, very good friends from meeting at her antique store. Wow. Yes. Uh-huh. We became very good friends. As a matter of fact, she taught me a lot. And a lot of the pieces that I have in my home was from her shop. Now she had this shop and I kid you not, you could barely squeeze in the door because she has too much stuff. <laughs> so you could spend some time looking around there for sure. Not only her, but she had a warehouse, Serena. When she kept mm. saying, I'm like, I got some things in the warehouse. And I'm like, a warehouse? She took me to this warehouse finally. And when you open up the door, it was packed. Wow. And all she had was like this little carving maze where you could, one person at a time had to walk through it. It was Hat so how did you, I'm just wondering how she would move things aside to get to all the treasures underneath. I mean, oh, a horror story, but you know what, <laughs> when I say she has some good stuff, your mouth would drop open from mm. what she had in that storage building. And she's accumulated over 50 years of stuff. I was amazed at what she had. So a lot of things that I got from her, not only the experience, but like I said, the friendship she was giving to me was a blessing. And I only stumbled across her because she was, her her shop was across the street from my children's pediatrician. And I saw the sign says antiques, et cetera. I said, when we leave out of here, we're going to slide over there. And from that point on, it was a, a, a match made in history. We were very good friends. That is amazing. It's great when you meet someone that has that level of influence in your life and Mm -hmm. you can really call them a friend. Mm -hmm. So what are some, and I know I had moved away from the cohesive asking you how to do cohesive. Yes, I'm sorry. (laughs) No, 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 no. Because we'll get back to that in a moment, but I'm Mm -hmm. curious, what are some of those tips and tricks that this woman, Joyce, taught you about looking Mm -hmm. for antiques? What are those things that people need to look for when they're looking for antiques? Well, she said, first of all, look at the quality. When you're opening up a dresser, look at the dovetail. That's very, very important. Mm -hmm. Um, Most furniture nowadays, you don't even see the dovetail. You just see them joined in together or stapled sometimes, which is, ugh, we cringe at that. (laughs) 
But she said, always look at the dovetail and then just kind of shake it, look at the chair, turn a chair over, see how it was made, look for certain nails that are aged that were used in the furniture. The older furniture was made where you had the cotton, you had the horse hair, you had all kinds of batting that was inside the chairs. So if you could kind of see between that, that, you know, was an antique. And the the legs in which they were carved. Look for those kind of traits, basically. You know, one thing that I look for, and I don't know if she had told you this, but I also look at the weight of something. If something feels very light to me, that tells me that it's not very good quality. Right, and it's not that old. Yeah, it's Mm -hmm. not that old. If it's got Mm -hmm. some weight to it, and Mm -hmm. I kind of struggle to pick it up, Yes, yeah. you know it's old. More, yeah, it's probably it made with wood. real wood, right? Yeah. Not the not that fake wood or whatever. <laughs> I don't know what they call it. It's just I don't know. You but know, my my husband <laughs> used to cry. Why you you make me sick buying all this heavy ass furniture? And I'm like, <laughs> you know what? Because it's gonna last. It's that's gonna gonna last. Life. Yes, <laughs> it's good quality, and it's not costing me an arm and a leg. I'm I'm paying right. quality stuff, and it's not costing me very much money. And you wind up spending more money buying stuff over and over again than you do when you buy one good piece. Yeah. You know, and that's what I kind of emphasize that once you buy it. And then some uh, one time a person said to me, well, who wants to keep a dresser for 50 years? Um, me, I do, because I'm not buying this stuff over and over again. Exactly. I don't exactly. see the need to do that. So there is, you know, I, I feel that there's no need to do that. And I feel that people that do that are just being wasteful. It's just wastefulness. Right. You know, there's exactly. nothing wrong with the dresser, but you now you just want something new, something different. Right. Move it to a different wall. How about that? That'll make it visually interesting. Maybe yes. we'll put, put it in a, a different room. Yes. Use something else. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Don't just keep buying furniture just for the sake of just it. for the thrill of looking for furniture. Right. Um, and also when I had talked to Kaveri from episode three, she had brought up that same point that you are more mindful when you understand the impact of buying new and buying repeatedly. You understand that impact on the environment because not just the fact that it's costing you more money, but you look at the people who maybe in other countries, they may not have as strict uh, environmental laws. And so they're exposed to chemicals and they don't have the same maybe safety procedures and precautions that we have in this country. So those people are being impacted. And so before you buy something, she said, just be more mindful about it. Buy good quality so that it's something that's going to last you for a long time. So it's not just about the money, but it's also the environmental factor too. You know, Serena, I was out thrifting one day and I saw this pile of furniture that this thrift store was going to have hauled to the dump. As I passed it, I was like, oh my God, there was this, first of all, my girlfriend who reupholsters furniture, I got all the cushions out of all the good furniture. I took all the, cause she could use the foam. That's yes. number one. We yes. were looking about breaking it down so she could use that foam again. So I gave her, I, I took all the foam out that I could of all the seats and the cushions, but there was this one Chesterfield sofa that was sitting on top of the pile. I wish I had had a truck that day and just drag that sofa off that pile because you and I know Chesterfield sofas cost a fortune. Mm -hmm. When I say nothing really wrong with it other than new furniture, new uh, fabric, it was solid. The tufting was still, it was tufted all around the back, the sides, the cushions was there. It just needed new fabric. Mm. And it was in, I just wanted to cry to have to leave that sitting there. Do you understand what oh, I mean? Oh, yes, I do. I, I do. wanted to literally cry. And I'm like, where are the designers of the world that are out here doing clients? Because I don't have a client base. Mm-hmm. But had I had one, that sofa somehow would have came off that pile. <laughs> and I would have just re- had it redone. And then, you know, for that yep. client's home. Because to me... for a sofa. Crazy, crazy. I'm like, could you have gone to Home Depot and rented a truck? Could you? (laughs) Um, Storage is my other main factor. Well, and that was my next question to you because (laughs) I am thinking about my own situation. 
Mm-hmm. And how when there's things that I come across, I have to tell myself no because I don't have anywhere to put it. Right. What do you what do? You do? do you have a garage? Do you have a stash have of a, things? I have a shed um, mm-hmm. on my property and it is packed. <laughs> when I say packed, packed. I feel like Joyce already all over again. I always remind myself I'm not going to be like this, but I am like that. And yes. I, I have a shed. My mother has a shed and I have hers packed with stuff. <laughs> I have furniture around me and it, it's, I just hate to see stuff just going to waste. I, I, I do. And I keep and saying, I can't do it anymore. Yes. We've yes, seen the beauty of it. We know that it has potential and mm. other people look at it and think that it's garbage. There's a chair. It was in the nursing home when my, my my grandmother had passed. I guess it was five years ago. And before she had passed, I noticed this chair in the nursing home. And I thought, wow, that's a beautiful chair. I wonder who that belongs to. It wasn't my grandmother's chair. So I think it belonged to the nursing home. Maybe someone had brought it in from a previous patient. On the day that she had passed. I wasn't, I think I was there maybe the day before and I knew that she was going to pass. And I remember saying to my mom, would you be able to get that chair? So I was able to get the chair. I think I took it with me that day and Mm -hmm. didn't tell my mom, but I reupholstered it and painted it. The wood was in pretty good condition. And I presented her with the chair. She didn't even know that I had refinished it. And I gave it to her as a gift, you know, this chair Uh that was in her mother's room. And it was such a special gift for her. So she's got it in her bedroom. But that chair, when she first saw that chair, she's like, what are you talking about? That chair is ugly. (laughs) When I saw it in its raw form, that chair is ugly. I said, no, this chair is beautiful. She doesn't use me because some people just don't have that vision, but it can hinder us when we see how much beauty is around us in junk because we want to save it all, but we don't have that much space to do it. And, And then we end up like, you know, like Joyce <laughs> with warehouses <laughs> of stuff that we know yeah. is good quality stuff. Yes. Yes. Oh, oh my God. It's an addiction, Serena, that we really it is. And have. You know, I, I have to admit that when I first moved into my house, you probably, you know, my story, I think anybody mm-hmm. listening to this probably knows my story, but in a nutshell, we bought an old house, a 1970s house in 2010 and we had spent all of our money buying the house. We didn't have any money left to decorate. And I would always loved thrift stores and started going to thrift stores to furnish it. And it became kind of an addiction. That's why I started my blog. I was documenting everything that I was doing. Right. And I had these huge piles in the garage, things that I could not possibly get enough time to refinish. And it was only when I started using power tools and I needed space to actually build and I wanted to work on projects that weren't just furniture, but maybe just building some things here and there. So Mm -hmm. that's the only time that I stopped bringing things in is because I, I, there was no other place for me to do projects. I needed that garage and Mm -hmm. I wanted a workshop. So even now, every now and then I'll bring something in, but I am much more measured about what I bring in because I right. know that I don't have the space. Yeah, me too. Same here. I mean, I was just out a couple of weeks ago and found a coffee table and I said, boy, I wish I could bring that home. But no, I don't need it. I don't need it. But I said, boy, I wish I could bring that home. And, you know, I call my sons up. Do you need anything? I, I go through my little phone. Does anybody need anything? And they'll say no, 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 no. And I'm like, Darn it. I was hoping someone would say someone. yes. So I could say, yay, yes. I got it. You know, because, but <laughs> because we love furniture so much, it's mm-hmm. not even a matter of us needing it. We're okay. Right. We're happy if somebody else can use it. I could go visit it. Yes. I always said it. <laughs> I could go visit. Exactly. Now that leads me to another question that I have because you helped your son redo his apartment. Was this his first home? Did he buy a home and this was his first home, his bedroom? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. That was my son. My youngest son, he bought a house and we bought everything. He paid cash for it. Oh, that's wonderful. And then he spent a lot of money fixing it up and redoing, rehabbing it and so forth. So I went thrifting for his whole house was furnished Mm. by thrift items. And I want to say we spent less than $500 on his furniture for his whole whole house. house? Oh my gosh. That is amazing. It was, it really was. And and it turned out beautiful. I mean, his room, his bedroom, I was just in awe with it, with how, and in his dining room, the whole, everything, everything was just turned out perfect. 
So oh. he was happy. I was happy. And it had a modern look. It didn't look like antique. And that was his one thing. He says, no antiques. I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, we did go with vintage. I know he said, I don't want no antiques. I said, okay, you got it. But we did more of a vintage, you know, the 70s, 80s era in his house. And it was it it turned out perfect. So it had that kind of a cool look to it, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I and I bought fabric for his window treatments that would modernize it. So that all brought it together. So his house really came out very, very nice. Now, how long did it take you to do his house? It took, I would say, as far as decorating it, mm -hmm. it just took a couple of months, maybe about two, two to three months. Okay. Yeah, it didn't take long because I would buy things. Um, even while he was rehabbing it, we were already buying things. Mm -hmm. And so he already had his apartment. So he had a few things from his apartment too, which were from thrift stores as well. My son's buy their stuff from thrift stores too. They go thrifting. Well, they learn from you. They learn that they don't have to go out here and spend crazy money to have a beautiful looking yes. house or whatever. So with that, in fact, as a matter of fact, wherever they go, they always say, mommy, there's thrift stores. I'm like, okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's amazing because that's something that you can share together. No matter where you yeah. go, you have mm -hmm. that common interest. And that leads me back to the question from before in terms of pulling it together, because you mentioned that he had some things from his apartment, which were thrifted. Maybe mm -hmm. they were in that seventies, eighties style, but mm -hmm. again, what are some additional tips? So we know that looking for similar wood shades, and if it's not the right. same shade plan to do some sweeping and refinishing in order to, to make sure those wood tones match. And so what are some other tips that people should keep in mind when trying to mix thrift store styles? For a cohesive look. Right. So say you want a, the mid-century style dining room set, but you have the tables and the chairs. So try to pick something in the 70s that would kind of blend with your dining room set. So if you want a china cabinet or a hutch, try to stick in that era. But if you want to go with Art Deco, if you want to mix Art Deco with vintage, you got to be mindful of the different styles of Art Deco. You don't want to mix something that's really curvy if mm -hmm. you have mostly straight lines. Got it. Mm -hmm. You kind of want to keep it a little cohesive. Okay. But what if you are doing, let's say, mid-century modern and you've got a lot of those straight lines and it starts looking too straight? Everything is just straight. Mm -hmm. How do you bring some softness into this when it's just, everything's just so angular? Well, you could take it to the, say, for instance, maybe on the wall, you might want to go with circles on the wall. If everything is boxed, so then on the wall, try to look for circular mm -hmm. things to hang, like mirrors or candle holders or wall art. Maybe just go with some circles instead to try to soften the straightness of everything. That's a great tip. Now, what about in terms of color? Do you do pops of color? Do you tend to stay in neutrals, neutral tones? You know, I love color and I try to incorporate as much color as I can. But lately I've been shifting a little to the more monochromatic. Mm -hmm. I don't know why, but I still love my color. I love, uh, I guess some colors are just too bright for me, but I like looking at them, but I can't have them in my home. So to right. Speak. Yeah, I mean, I I love seeing everybody else's with color and I'm like, wow, that's nice. But for me, when I put it in the house, I'm like, ah, I'm uh, I, like the pinks and the reds and things like that. I love looking at it, but I just can't bring it into my home for me mm -hmm. to look at every day. And I keep saying I want to add more. Now, my son's, when I did his bedroom and he wanted black walls, I was like, oh, I don't know me about the black walls. I'm scared, you know? <laughs> Now I love it, but we painted his room the navy blue. It was a deep, deep navy blue, yeah. room, and it looks fabulous. So it really yeah. does. And um, those curtains that you made, those were yes. two dollar a yard curtains. Yes, it was at a fabric warehouse here. We have, and I'm so upset they closed down, but they were having this sale, and that fabric was yes, two dollars a yard. Mm. Unbelievable. And See, those are the kind of bargains perfect. I love. Yes. They, yeah. Everything just popped. And then I found a solid bedspread from uh, Home Goods. 
-hmm. and that blended perfectly. And then I made some pillows to help accent that blue and the blue on the wall, but a different pattern. Mm -hmm. I like mixing patterns. That's for sure. I do like doing it. It adds a little bit more creativity or something to to spice it up a little bit. So pillows would be, sorry, go ahead. I don't like everything to be the same, like blue, white, blue, white, or, you know, I I like different colors all around. Right. So that's one thing that people can do then taking a little bit of inspiration from you is mixing some patterns and maybe using the pillows as a way to do that without doing huge amounts of pattern mixing, but just a little bit. And I noticed you have an Etsy shop too, and you've got some pillows and they're all sort of like geometric type. Right. Yes. And yeah. So I like that style of yours. That's Thank you. Tip. I appreciate that. Yeah. We, we used to make pillows years ago and then I stopped. And then now I'm like, okay, I'm about ready to start doing it again. It gives me a chance to work with fabrics because I love fabrics. Yes. And kind of be a little creative with it. So that's what I'm doing now. I wish you lived close to me because <laughs> <laughs> we would be like fast friends, shopping oh, stores, most and antique definitely. stores. Hey, most bring your sewing machine over. Let's make pillows today. Yes. I'm trying to tell you, we would be dangerous. <laughs> yes, we would. Now, let me ask you, where do you get your inspiration from? Are there magazines or are there certain blogs mm-hmm. that you like to read that give you ideas? Where do you get your ideas from? I used to love going through magazines and I used to stop going through the magazines only because they just weren't showing enough of African-American homes. So Mm -hmm. I kind of just branched off from that because I'm like, okay, this is not where it is. But now Instagram, I go through a lot of the uh, interior designers, Mm -hmm. their pages. I love what they're doing out there. And, but I know, and I'm keeping it real. uh, That is not my, uh, that is beyond my price range of a lot of the stuff. So if I could find something I could kind of replicate that look, then I'm going to do that. And I was able to do that, especially with pillows, become more creative with those. Yes. But a lot of stuff I get, if the designers are looking at this, then maybe I could find that similar and thrift it, which I have been, and I'm lucky, lucky to do, was that being able to find some of the things that they're finding I'm finding on a thrift level. What do you notice the trends heading to right now? And I'll be honest with you. I don't follow a lot of trends. I don't follow designers. For me, I feel like making my home beautiful and comfortable is mm-hmm. great, but I, but I don't ever sub- submerge myself into the design field. Yeah. I don't know why, because it's not really my interest to, to, right. to do that. But I think it's important to do because when you're trying to redo a room and you're someone who wants to pull in the sort of some of the trends without paying a lot of money, who are those designers that you follow and what are the current trends that you see happening right now? The designers that I follow is Veronica. She's at Casa Valora. I follow her because I she helped me understand the concept of mixing fabrics. She pulls Mm. a lot of different patterns together. And I just kind of studied what she does and developed it from watching her. Mm. I don't replicate her, but I could see how if you study her looks and her pattern type, if you pick up that one common color, you could blend a lot of different colors together. Mm. So I follow her. She is a a designer that I, I love her style. And I became Facebook friends with her as well. She's with HGTV. I I do watch her and I like her style. Mm -hmm. Uh, Another one is my aunt. She's not really a designer, (laughs) but she can be one. She doesn't have to be famous. But she sews and her sewing skills are just fabulous. She's another one that helped me understand the concept of mixing patterns. So those are my two favorites that I like watching. And her name is Linda G. Loving Home. And she is fabulous. I love how she works with the fabric. She works with flowers and her decor skills are very wonderful. So that's my aunt. (laughs) I think it's in my blood. It might be in my blood. (laughs) It sounds like it is. So it seems like that's where designers are going now. And maybe it's always been that way, but but Mm -hmm. you see them mixing patterns. Mm -hmm. And for people who are listening to this, who want to learn how to put a room together, that would be an area where they can do a little bit more studying, study the people who know how to put patterns together, because you're right. 
if everything in your room is of just one color or you're trying to match things that just don't look right, you're going to walk into that room and feel unsettled. And then you're going to see everyone else on Instagram and Facebook and Pinterest putting together these amazing rooms. And you're going to think, well, why can't I do this? So right. mixing exactly. patterns. So can't, like, like mixing, like if you have a room full of silver and white and bling and stuff, you can't throw in something that's very modern. Mm-hmm. it's just not going to blend right. So you kind of ease up on the bling a little bit and ease up on those kind of tones and then start incorporating other softer patterns to blend with it. It doesn't have to always be that one color, gold and white, silver and white, or blue and white, or just find other colors that will help blend in without causing that stark. Yes. Um, like a stark contrast. Yes, Exactly. Got it. Now, the piece that you had sent me, because I did ask you before we started talking, tell me a little bit about your favorite piece and uh, then we'll wrap it up. But this piece that you found for $40 was amazing. And it didn't look like you had to do very much to make this piece. Tell me a little bit more about this piece. So yeah, I found that here in town, actually, as a matter of fact, we had a yard sale and the guy was selling it for $40. It's an art deco cabinet. Now I collect uh, vintage glassware, barware. And I said, okay, well, my glasses would look really nice stored in that cabinet. And they do. <laughs> on display because now they, they were in my china cabinet all hidden. So when I got the piece and I washed it down and gave it some love and I saw that the inside was covered in like a fabric, that was coming off and uh, asked a friend of mine, she said, well, just go ahead and stay. And I'm like, I want something different, something that's going to really stand out and give it that pop. Once I did the wood over and it just needed really a good coat of stain to bring mm-hmm. the color back. And then I gave it a nice shine. So just kind of reconditioned the wood and I bought some glass shelves. And then I bought this wallpaper on um, Etsy through an Etsy shop and it just came together so perfectly. And I know I spent less than a hundred bucks on that. I want to say about $70 altogether, getting it back together. Wow. You know, it would be so amazing to take a picture of this and go to that house who had put it out on the yard sale and be like, Hey, did you know that it could look like this? You know, there used to be a show. I Mm -hmm. think it was maybe in the UK, there was a show. I don't remember the name where this woman would rescue things before people were throwing it into the trash. Mm -hmm. She would rescue things, totally redo them and sell them. And she would go back to the people who had gotten rid of it and say, Hey, do you know that I redid this lamp and it made you like 70 pounds or whatever it was. (laughs) And she would give them the money. Wow. Yeah. It's all, it's always amazing to me to think of what Mm -hmm. someone's reaction would be if they see how beautiful it is. So believe it or not, the guy that I bought it from, I showed him the, and he loved it. Oh, well, we're God. all Facebook friends. And he, when he saw it, he says, Kim, I'm jealous. <laughs> but he, I'm sure knew he, I would, he knew I would turn it into something really fabulous. So, yes. So really now, did you that I get pieces from? <laughs> now, did you sand that down a little? How did you do that? Did you sand it down a little bit or did you just add a coat of stain? The legs I gave a little sanding too because it had some rough edges from when they were moving it and bumping mm-hmm. it. So I gave the legs a little bit of a light sand, but the top part didn't need any uh, sanding at all. Wow. It just needed restaining. So I bought some stain. I think it was the walnut stain. There's three stains on there, mm-hmm. and I just wiped it down. The pen with the little uh, little inlays that's on the mirror. I used the pen to draw, you know, to fill all of that in. Oh, wow. So that helped with that, but it really didn't need a lot of work. And that's the beauty of it. I honestly didn't do uh, just mostly just staining. Mm. It just needed TLC all around it. And the first thing that I thought of when I saw it was how beautiful the grain of the wood was. And then the second thought that I had was, I wonder how Jamela thinks about people who paint wood like this. (laughs) So I just have to ask you because I myself am guilty of painting wood that's beautiful, but Mm -hmm. knowing that, okay, this thing is just too big and dark and heavy for my room. I need something lighter. What do you think about the pieces that are painted that have such a great grain of wood? And do you still paint pieces? I cringe, first of all, (laughs) when I see someone paint something that beautiful. I, I love looking at wood, the beauty of the wood. 
Now, some pieces do require painting because I have a, a, a cabinet, a Schifero cabinet that I did paint years ago, white and crackled it because the wood was badly damaged. Mm -hmm. So painting was my only option and I had only paid $5 for it. So there was no, and it's a nice cabinet, but like I said, the wood was badly damaged. So when I painted it, the crackle white paint, you can't even see the damages through it. Mm. That I don't mind painting, but when something is in excellent shape and the wood is in great condition, I myself don't like painting it because you're ruining the beauty of it per se. I, I always say, if you want to paint something, paint something from Ikea. Don't paint the good wood, mm -hmm. the good antique stuff. That's me. Mm -hmm. Now, a friend of mine who is in the uh, refinishing business, he hates it when people brings in a good, solid, antique piece and say, can you paint this for me? He says, oh, no, I'm not going to paint it. I'm just going to, so you can come back five years and ask me to strip it because you want the wood back again or you're sick of that color. No. Right. <laughs> so he turns away anything that someone wants painted. He won't do it. Not for a good piece of furniture. He mm -hmm. won't do Because he says he knows Five or ten, when the painting phase goes away, they're going to want it stripped, and then you got more problems. And some things are just harder to strip when you got to get into those little intricate. Oh details. yes, yes. Yeah, so you just created more work. So now he's going to charge you even more money to strip it. So stripping anything that has nooks and crannies, it is the mm -hmm. worst. I don't know yes, if you've ever do. done it. It is the worst. I hate it. And for myself, that is when I will usually especially if it's not in great condition, but if it's something that has a lot of nooks and crannies or curved areas, I don't bother with trying to strip that because trying to get a nice strip on a curved leg or something that has a lot of nooks and crannies. Like it's really, and stuff. Yeah, yes. It's yes. Speaking of which I just did, I don't know if you saw it, but I just did a wing back chair. It took me three years to do. It had mm -hmm. claw feet. I did not strip it and sand it before I reupholstered it. So I had to do it at the end, which doesn't make any sense, but I covered up the fabric, made sure I didn't destroy it. It took me like an entire day to try to, I'd stripped it previously. Let's put it that way. I stripped it previously before the fabric went on, but I never finished it out where I sanded it and all of that. It was very difficult to get into the claws of where that claw was holding the ball of the foot right. to get uh -huh. into. Yeah. And the stain that I used, it ended up looking a little blotchy. I, of course, I could have used some preconditioner. I don't know if it would have made a difference on those feet, but I ended up adding like three coats, four coats, and it ended up looking good. But it reminded me of why I don't like to sand and, and strip anything that has a nook or cranny. It's hard to do. Mm -hmm. I think when people go to the thrift store and they find something that has nooks and crannies and they're like, oh, I'm going to strip this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you might want to pass by that piece. If you're, yeah. you're going to strip it, you have to know what you're getting into. It's not easy to do. I tend to like to strip and sand and refinish things that are, that have flat surfaces. Right. That's exactly. so much easier to do. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's exactly right. That's so much easier to do. I won't do the other things because it's a, it's a lot. The last question that I have for you is for people who do want to refinish furniture, they don't want to paint it. Do you have any like favorite tips or tricks or things that you do when you refinish furniture? Well, Serena, I really don't call myself a refinisher. I have tried refinishing one piece and I failed at it. You are the DIY bomber, you know, I'm, you <laughs> lock things out. I'm serious. I want to be you in my next lifetime, <laughs> but I always look for a professional. Now, when it's like you said, something just straight and easy to strip, just take your time, but make sure you're sanding it properly. I learned that the hard way too, because one time I was stripping something, the sandpaper just, it scratched it all up. I was highly upset with myself for not picking the right sandpaper because, but then I didn't know anything about it. And that was one of the things that my friend Joyce had taught, talked about is that you got to make sure you use the right sandpaper for these projects because yep. you will scratch your surface. So that was one of the main things. And then also cleaning your wood properly to prep it for all of this is important as well. Mm -hmm. But I've only done two pieces. And like I said, one of them, I messed up really badly. And I said, okay, well, next time I'm going to take my time and do it the right way. I try not to 
take on a lot of heavy projects of refinishing things. Mm -hmm. Minimum work is my motto. But if if it's something really, really nice, I give it to the professionals because I want it to turn out right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, Uh Sometimes I'm just experimenting with a piece. You know, the very first thing that I ever tried to strip and stain Mm -hmm. was my $12 dining room table, which I'm still using to this day. So it's been since 2010 Mm -hmm. and it was so blotchy. I don't even know if I was using an orbital sander at that time. I might've even just been using my hand and some sandpaper, not knowing what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And of course, when you're sanding things, if you have spots where you don't remove all the finish, that new stain is not going to penetrate. And so, yes. So I ended up leaving all of these blotches. I ended up having to redo the whole thing. And even then it wasn't that great. I sort of looked at it as like, oh, well now it just looks, um, what's that word? Darker. (laughs) Yeah, like it, it, it looks like it was intentional. Like I intentionally did it that way, you know, but, but I've learned some things over the way in terms of the, the sandpaper that you had mentioned. Um, whenever I sand something, well, let's put it this way. If let's say you've got a nice flat surface, like a table, for example, you can either strip it with chemical stripper, like citrus strip, which is a good one. It's safe to use. And mm-hmm. Then once you've scraped everything off, then you can sand it down. Or it, it, in my opinion, if it doesn't have that many layers, then sometimes right. I'll just use an orbital sander and do that. But in terms of the scratches that you had mentioned, what I find is that when the orbital sander is moving too quickly, and mm-hmm. I've done this myself, you know, when, when you're pressing down on it, you're trying to get it done quickly, right. going like this back and forth, back and forth. Right. All it's doing is scratching the surface and it's leaving these things called pigtails. And you don't even notice it until you go to put stain on it. Yes. The proper way to do it is to go slow with your orbital sander. I believe I've read maybe about one inch per second or something like that. So don't run it across like you're having a race. And then also don't push down, let the sander do its job. Right, exactly. Again, you're going to have the swirls and then work your way down. So starting at maybe an 80 grit sandpaper, which is rough enough to remove that surface, maybe 60, 60 is pretty pretty, uh, rough. Mm -hmm. Going from an 80 to maybe like a 150. And usually they tell you to stop at 150 and then take some hand sandpaper and do that as your final sanding at 150. And this is one mistake that I used to make. And I'll leave this final point is that I used to finish off my sanding with 220, which is a very fine sandpaper. Uh The problem is that when you're restaining, you need some scratching there in order for the stain to penetrate. Yes. So you don't want to go any further than 150. You want to finish it off hand sanding in the direction of the grain that should leave enough scratching that you should be able to get a a nice smooth finish. And also certain types of woods, you might need to do a pre-conditioner because if you don't, then you can get blotchy wood. So there's a lot of things that I've learned over the years from stripping and all of that. And I, I tend to want to strip things now instead of just painting them, especially if it's uh, a table or something that has flat surfaces. So I have a blog post and I'm going to leave a link down for anybody that wants to uh, check it out. But there's a blog post that has some of these tips for stripping and, and staining furniture. Oh my gosh. We've oh been talking gosh, about gosh, wow. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> where can people find you? I know you've got a blog and yeah. on social media. So tell us where they can find you. Okay, well, I blog at Viva La Vintage for your home.com. And then I have a Facebook page as well for that. And then on Instagram, I am You Are Vintage Girl. I'm mostly on Instagram now, but uh, my blog is uh, where I, I, I love to get more personal as, as far as talking about things and finding things. So you can mm-hmm. find me on those two places. Okay. Well, I will leave links to those down below. People can follow her. And you also have some YouTube videos up too, right? I am starting with YouTube. I do have a few videos up. This technology stuff is something that I really got to get myself used to. But yes, I do have a YouTube channel and that is at Jamela Wallace as well. I am starting to post. I said this year was going to be, I was going to do more posting of videos on my YouTube channel. I promise this to myself. <laughs> you know what? I need to do that too, because I looked at how many videos I did last year. I was like, wait, where have I been? <laughs> like I have not, you know, I've been doing a lot more 
content for brands like Home Depot mm-hmm. and some of these companies Correct. will reach out and say, hey, can you mm-hmm. do some content for us? So it's been pulling me away from my blog and my channel. And so for 2021, right. I have the same goal as you is to try at least once a week to post yeah. something. I'm supposed to post something today and I have no idea what I'm posting. So <laughs> I guess I, I've already broken my New Year's resolution. <laughs> All right. Well, that concludes this episode, episode seven of the Thrift Diving Podcast. And be sure to come back because next podcast, we're going to be talking to Jamela again, but we're going to be talking about real estate investing because you do some real estate investing. You've transformed some homes. So we're going to talk about that because we think it's a natural segue from finding ugly things and making them look pretty to finding ugly houses and making them look pretty. All right. Thank you so much, Jamela. And we will talk to you in the next episode. Okay. Thank you again, Serena. Well, I hope you found this conversation to be helpful. I thought the tips that she gave were pretty good. And I think when we're going to the thrift store, if we're intentional about what we buy, we're looking for quality, we're looking for dovetails, things that are heavy. If we're looking for things that are in the similar wood shades so that we can bring it all together and have it look cohesive, we don't have to spend a lot of money making our home look good. But what I also took from that conversation is that knowing how to mix patterns is really how you pull it together. It's sort of like the icing on the the cake, right? So I have to do a little bit of homework myself. And all the links down below that we had discussed, the people that she follows on Instagram, you can find those links down below in the show notes. But definitely come back for episode eight because we're continuing this conversation with Jamela Wallace talking about investment properties. And again, if you love DIY, if you like taking things that are ugly, making them look pretty, This is something that you can do. You can pull your money together with friends, with family, and turn your love of DIY and creating into a passion, whether it's investment properties, whether it's creating art for your Etsy shop. There's a lot of things you can do with this. All right, be sure to leave a review for these podcasts. Let me know if you like this. I will see you in the next episode. And remember, we've got a bunch of other topics that we're talking about. So don't miss the next episode of the Thrift Diving Podcast. Thanks for listening.